Wait, but do I do I have to invite them or can I maybe not invite them? Is there a rule for this? I don't want to, but I feel like I have to and it's like a sense of obligation, but like I really don't want to. That's a lot of money to spend on them to come eat a meal at, at our event and I just don't know if I'm down with it. If any of those have resonated with you, first of all, hi, welcome. You picked the right video to watch. <laughs> Second of all, if you're new here, hey, my name is Jamie Wolfer. I'm your online wedding planner, and I'm here to help you figure out how to navigate this whole wedding planning business because it is time consuming and stressful and expensive, and we ain't got time for that, okay? We need some very clear guidelines to operate off of. And that is the whole intent of this week's video is to talk about guest list rules, the do's and don'ts of the RSVP list. Who should you actually invite? So. Without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. And if you've been around this channel for a hot minute, then you'll know that this co topic was covered up uh, four years ago, okay? So we're recycling this one. We're bringing it back up, making it a little bit more relevant, a little bit better lighting situation and audio. And also, if you notice any consistencies between that video and this video, good. That means I've stayed on brand for the last few years. But if I happen to miss anything, feel free to let me know in the comments below, because as always, I love hearing from you guys. But we are gonna cover three separate categories in this video. We're gonna cover the etiquette rules, not using finger quotes, yep. And we are gonna talk through a couple questions that you should be asking yourself with every single member. Yes, and I do mean every single member on your guest list. And then lastly, some pro tips from someone who's a pro that has tips. Okay, great. And in addition to this, uh, there are exceptions to every single one of these rules, okay? It's like a Venn diagram of feelings uh, and emotions and finances and expectations, so I would be remiss if I didn't just like call that out into the open real quick, okay? So some of these you might be like, that doesn't apply here. Great. What we're doing here in this video is we are firming up your decisions that you're making. Whether you agree with me or you disagree with me, at least you're making a decision, and that's perfectly fine. You are more than welcome to do that. It's your wedding. You gotta figure out what works best for you and the expectations your family has for you and the finances that you have and the emotions involved with all of this. I'm just here to like say words to make you feel things. That's my new slogan. <laughs> Group number one, or rule number one, you know, number one, uh, extended family. The general rule here is if you invite one cousin, you have to invite them all. Here's where I'm gonna put a little bit of Jamie's been doing YouTube for a little bit longer and gained a little bit more experience on cultures outside of the one that she uh, lives in. There's probably a few of you watching this that are like, that's cute, I have 70 cousins, I can't do that. I'm well aware. You'll probably know how to navigate that with your family and your culture way better than I would. But generally speaking, if you do ostracize a family member who's considered kind of on the same playing field that you have the same level of relationship with, it can cause for some hurt feelings and for some frustrations. So if it's a giant family, if you can't afford to invite everybody, that's something that you might want to communicate. That's my, that might be something that you're expected to communicate. You know the pattern and the rhythm of your family culture way better than I do. So if you're like, that, no, we have 100 cousins between the two of us, that's never happening. Like, thank you so much for your astute advice. Then I would say make sure that you are obviously intentional about those that you're close to, inviting them to your event. And if there needs to be any sort of mitigation of uh, those that are not invited, take that into account. What I don't wanna do here is, well, we're just inviting who we invite and everyone else can deal with those feelings and emotions. We still wanna be sensitive to the fact that maybe people are really excited about participating with you at your event and uh, they might be bummed if they don't get a chance to do that. In fact, I did an entire deep dive over on my podcast, Engage, with Kara, the bridal coach, to walk through some of the emotions and finances and expectations of all the stuff that comes along with this. So I know that there's a lot to unpack here. I highly encourage you to go check that out. I'm gonna link it down below for you to take a peek at because there's so much more that deserves to be unpacked around this in a really conversational manner because there's a lot of stuff attached to all of this. For now, let's go ahead and stick with the rules. Rule number two, children. Same kind of policy here. It's really good idea to pick like an arbitrary number or cutoff. Anyone under the age of 12, not invited. Little bit of an aside, if they are a small infant, <laughs> whether they are exclusively nursed or or not, the rules kind of don't apply to them. You'll have to be very specific if you don't want someone's infant coming, and that may mean that they're not coming, especially if they are the sole source of food. You know what I mean? You know? You can't be like, yeah, leave your baby at home. You can pump in the bathroom. That's kind of putting a lot of expectations on a young mom, okay? But you can kind of come up with this rule on your own. No one under the age of 18, no one under the age of 12. What is that cutoff parameter for you and your fiance? 
And then how do you communicate that? Because no, you do not have to invite children. I love going to weddings with children. I love running weddings with children. I think there's this really big fear that the children are just gonna be absolutely out of control. I personally have not seen that happen at a wedding, but I know that that's happened at weddings in the past. I would be remiss if I didn't bring that up. I think for the most part, children are extremely well behaved, but you know the children in your life probably better than some random lady on the internet, so you can make a decision there. But whatever decision you make, then the problem comes to how do you explain that to people? And you're gonna wanna do that in a couple of different places, right? Uh, on your invitation, um, adults only event, or as much as we love children, hire a babysitter, leave them at home, we want you to put on your dancing shoes, let your hair down and really enjoy yourself. There's a ton of different phrasing, I said this last time I made this video, there's a ton of different phrasing that, just Google it, go on Pinterest, find one that suits what you're trying to explain and the feeling that you're trying to convey. You can literally just say adults only event, super clear. Or you can make it a little bit witty, a little bit fun, and tell them the heart and intent behind it. The exception to this rule would be any kids that are in your wedding party, flower girl, ring bearer, um, or again, infants that might need to come, or if there is a specific few children that are very poignant and very important to you and your fiance, then that is obviously an allowance that you can, you can absolutely make. Now, of course, communicating that to anyone who might have some hurt feelings or be a little bit miffed that would be like, wait, you said no kids and there's kids here. But like, yeah, they belong to my sister. You know, I can't, I can't say no to my sister's children who they call me auntie, okay? And they're super cute and I can't say no to them. But like paying for a bunch of extra kids doesn't really work for us. However you want to phrase it, you really can communicate this in a very kind and effective manner. You are not required to have children, but if you do, if there is a little bit of confusion behind what that rule is, be prepared to maybe offer an explanation if necessary. I would also recommend putting this on your wedding website. Uh, will everyone read it? No. So you absolutely need to have it on the invitation, um, but reiterating it on the website can be really helpful as well and give you an opportunity to expand on that, should you choose to. Group number three, or etiquette rule number three, you were invited to their wedding, so do you need to invite people to your wedding? Mm, yes and no. So usually, unless there's been some sort of colossal fallout, if you were in their wedding or attended their wedding the last 18 to 24 months, Etiquette says you should probably invite them to your wedding now, unless you're not speaking. You know, like obviously I'm not trying to dredge up stuff for you. You do you. But if their wedding was five years ago and you guys have really lost touch, there is absolutely no requirement for you to send it. Etiquette says there's no requirement. What you feel in here, that's up to you. That's up to your fiance. And we'll kind of help you filter through those when we get to the questions in just a minute. Uh, group number four, rule number four. <sighs> I really should have firmed that up before I got started, would be plus ones. This is a divisive one, and I don't know why. We do something called Unpopular Wedding Opinions on Thursdays over on Instagram, and y'all, people get spicy about plus ones. Some people are like, how dare you not give everyone a plus one? And I'm like, how, what's it like to be made of money? That's great. Plus ones are not a requirement. When they are a requirement, and I'm, I almost used finger quotes again, but I stopped myself. You saw that, right? You saw it? Is if this couple has been together six months plus, if they're engaged, if they're long-term partners, where it's like it would be seen as an etiquette slight to not invite them, right? The six-month rule tends to be a really good one. But if you want to stick to engaged and or married or have been together for like years, that's whatever that cutoff range is in your mind, whatever you're firming up as I'm saying this, could be a great copy paste parameter for every single person you invite to your event. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule that I think we should really highlight. I would consider maybe adding a plus one for anyone in your wedding party. Now this might depend on whether you're doing a head table or not. Do you want their plus one to be seated alone? A couple things to filter through there, but your wedding party's doing a lot. They probably spent a lot on the outfit that they're wearing. They've been with you all day. There's been a lot of activities and expenses involved. So throwing them a bone and letting them bring a plus one or a date to your event could be a really great way of handling that. But also it's, it still adds money. So let's be honest. You don't have to do that if you don't want to, but you can. Okay. And then the only other like broad sweeping exception that I can think of would be someone who's like coming in from out of town. They don't really know anybody, but they're really important and you want them there, but you don't want them to feel like they're by themselves and they're gonna be really lonely. Maybe throw them a bone, give them a plus one, give them an opportunity to bring someone. Why do you keep saying throw a bone? I don't like the connotation of that, but we've repeated it multiple times at this point. Allow them the opportunity to bring a plus one so they have someone to talk to and someone to hang out with because it's not like you're gonna be glued at their side the whole night. You got a lot of things to do, but you still want them there. And group number five, etiquette rule number five, 
we've made it this far, would be any other group outside of that. It could be church group, could be soccer group, could be uh, co-workers. Again, this kind of falls into the same category as extended family. If you're gonna invite half your soccer team and not the other half, things get a little bit uncomfy. In fact, uh, I think it was yesterday I was doing a Q&A over on Instagram and someone said, everyone in my friend group was invited to my friend's wedding except for me. And I told them that it's okay, I understand weddings are expensive, but it still hurt. So we really wanna avoid those situations that can be, I don't know what it is about weddings that feel so, like such a pinnacle moment, right? Just feel so powerful whether you're invited or not. We really want to avoid overall sensations of like, you've been left behind or forgotten which is like the exact opposite of Ohana. <laughs> if there are individual coworkers and or members of your soccer team that you hang out with outside of that entity, outside of that group, yes, you can invite them individually. Just caution them to maybe not talk about it in front of a bunch of people or in front of that group and let them know that like, hey, obviously you and I, we have a special relationship. I'm not inviting everyone from the team. It's just gonna be you. So like keep it on the hush hush, but also here's your invitation and RSVP. Thank y'all. Coworkers, if you work with hundred people, you're not inviting all of them. No one's expecting that, maybe they're. And if they are, they're crazy, okay? But if you work on a team of five and you invite four of them, someone might have some feelings about it. If you still wanna do that, that's okay. Just keep it on the hush hush and don't talk about it at work that much or talk about it in group settings to really make that person feel extremely singled out. So we got the five rules or five groups. Now let's filter those five through the following questions. Number one, would I take them to dinner and pay for it? but I take them to dinner and pay $100 for it. I have a whole video called the number one budget killer. I'm gonna spoil the punchline right now. It is your guest list. Having a large guest list can really ratchet up the cost for your wedding day, but you can either make your guest list work for your budget or your budget work for your guest list. There is fluidity here. It's not a hard and fast rule, but we have to be mindful. A 500 person wedding inherently will most likely cost more than a 50 person wedding. Let's be real here, folks. So if you need to come down to making some of those cuts and you need to make it non-emotional and you wanna make it fact-based, would you take that person out to dinner and spend $100 on their meal? Because inherently, that is what you're doing. You're spending a lot of money for that person to eat that food and sit in that seat at that table with that tablecloth and that centerpiece, I could keep going with this. And that has a really big price tag attached. And maybe answering that question will help you clarify whether they should be invited or not. Question number two. Have I seen them in the last 12 months? Or will I see them in the next 12 months? Uh, could I go two years without speaking to this person? And there isn't like a very clear response to this, right? You could be like, no, I've known this person for 20 years and I don't see them all the time, but I'm still inviting them to my wedding, right? That's like, no dice, I'm doing it. Or it could be really clarifying where you're like, yeah, we actually like don't hang out <laughs> or see each other or talk to one another or communicate anymore. And I might just be doing this out of a sense of obligation. And probably the most poignant question would be, have, has this person or this group or this family had an impact, either direct or indirect, on my relationship with my fiance? Family members that you grew up with probably helped to mold you into who you are today. Your college roommate, yeah, pretty big effect on who you are, especially if you spent all four years with that person. Coworkers that you've only been working with for six months, nah, probably not, you know, like probably a little bit less, but asking this question can help you filter through some of those emotional obligations to help remind you that uh, you don't have to invite absolutely everybody you know. Now, just to wrap things up with a couple of pro tips from someone who's seen this a lot, okay? A list versus B list, I don't like it. I didn't like it four years ago when I first made this video and I still don't like it now. I don't know why people do it. I just know this is what it is and it's very frustrating, but it is, it is a true fact. The administrative details that come with an A list versus a B list or the hope that people are gonna respond in time, that you can send out more invitations, really complicates things. So might I encourage you to come up with just a baseline list of like, here are the people that we want, come heck or high water. If you have some space later on and you can add a few people on, great. But we are not banking on enough A people to say no, that we have room, time, space to send out a B list of invitations. All right. Uh, tip number two, we kind of touch on this just a little bit, but don't talk about your wedding in front of people that you don't intend to invite. Don't do it. Don't, it's so tempting. Now, if they ask questions, of course, you can respond to them uh, and you'll probably get that. So when's my invitation coming? <laughs> kind of conversations, because people are just, they mean well, but goodness gracious. So a good response to that would be, 
I am so excited that you're excited for our event. Thank you so much for being invested in it and asking about it. As much as we wish we could invite everybody, we just don't have the budget uh, for something like that. So we're keeping it intimate and we're keeping it on the smaller side or our venue doesn't allow for more than X amount of people and we've got big families. You don't owe them an explanation, but it does help to like get out of the conversation should you choose to offer one with honesty and integrity, right? Like, hey, I mean, yeah, of course, we'd love to have the whole team, the whole, all of our coworkers there, but that doesn't really make sense financially. Um, it's super expensive and that's, that adds up really quick, but we look forward to hanging out with you afterwards. I can't wait to come back in and, and uh, chat with you when we get back from our honeymoon. Exit stage left. The next pro tip, okay, needs to be unpacked. Like definitely in that episode with Kara, we talk about this a little bit more, but remember who's paying. Uh, there will be a little bit more gravity attached to the person who's writing all the checks. Like if your parents are contributing to your event or maybe covering the entirety of it, there needs to be at least the respect of a conversation around what that guest list looks like. Now, a lot of people will say, it's not a family reunion. My family doesn't get to decide. My parents don't get to have a say. That's not how I operated with my parents. I was like, yeah, I mean, like I want to invite your friends because they're important to me and they've been, I filter them through these questions. They've been important in my life, but I'm not just inviting people just to invite them. But my parents say in my wedding, was important. I appreciated that. I liked having their input. So don't feel like you have to go completely black or white on this, but run them through those questions as well. If you're running into a circumstance where a parent has a huge, huge guest list, you can walk them through the cost, remind them of how expensive it's going to be, and then let them know how this could potentially be detrimental to your wedding where you can say, hey, if we invite your 100 people, I get like 10 for the budget that we have designated. What can we do to like tip the scales a little bit more effectively so this is an event that reflects what we really want out of this and still can honor some of your friends that you'd like to invite. And last tip, little, little snippety tidbit, is as you are putting these together, as you're putting your guest list together and writing this down, first of all, probably should do it in a spreadsheet. If you need to do pen to paper, totally do it. But spreadsheets are fantastic for just like shuffling groups of people around. We have an entire section of the master plan completely dedicated to your guest list. A whole spreadsheet already put together for you that translates perfectly, I've tested them, perfectly into all of the RSVP tracking websites for like The Knot or other different locations like that where all of the column names transfer over really nicely. I don't think I've ever actually mentioned that detail on here, but you want to have some sort of tracking system. And as you're putting them together, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're kind of grouping them as you go. So like all of your soccer friends can be at a table together all of your church friends, all of your coworkers. And when you finally do get those RSVPs, there's gonna be some swaps that are gonna be made because obviously not everybody can attend, but at least you have a really good skeletal framework to go off of. You can do pen to paper, but I highly recommend you're gonna have to have it on a spreadsheet anyways for RSVP tracking. So do it in one of those, ideally in the one in the master plan. And trust me when I say this, it will make your life easier, astronomically easier. Every single person that's followed this bit of advice has gone, oh my gosh, I did not realize how stressful this was going to be. Thank you so much for recommending that. You're welcome. I love how I keep doing these reboots on some of these old videos and the original one's like 12 minutes and then the reboot is like way longer because I've learned so much over the last few years and one thing that I always want to do is be transparent with you guys and really talk through what this process looks like because you deserve to be empowered. You deserve to have a purpose and a reason for why you're making these decisions and if I can be here to support you along that process, I would be honored to do that. So that's all we have for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you like the video, jump on down there, hit that like button and subscribe to this channel for more tips and tricks for the modern day bride. If you are struggling with your wedding planning, you do not have to do this alone. I created the master plan for you specifically. I am live in there every single month to answer your questions. Every month, every single week, we have a planner live in our chat responding to your questions over in the membership. We want to make sure that you feel super supported at every single step of the way. So don't hesitate. Join the master plan today. You do not have to struggle through this. You can have a relaxing wedding day. And until next week, bye guys. Mm -hmm.